Hey guys, Peter Franson here. I wanted to post a video that could answer some questions about Eldarast, the bitter, senile old wizard that I played as in my uh, Skyrim playthrough series and in my upcoming Dragon Age playthroughs, uh, because I imagine some people might have some questions about his background, who he is, why I choose to play as a character like him. First, I'm going to give you the meta-level history of the character's creation, and then I'll... Uh, let Eldarast share his origin story with you. And finally, you'll get another presentation of his final moments in the world of Skyrim uh, to help set up the new Dragon Age series that's starting next week. And you can find timestamps below if any part of that in particular is of interest to you, and you can skip right to it. But for now, I think the first time I played as Eldarast was in a tabletop Dungeons & Dragons group back in late 2014. Uh, that's when I created his backstory and figured out his basic personality and motivation. Um, his name comes from two different sounds that are meant to kind of subtly evoke characteristics of his. So Elder, suggesting someone old, and Rast, which I thought sounded a little bit like Wrath um, and might evoke that sentiment a little bit on uh, just kind of a subconscious level. I pretty much made him exclusively at that time for comedic value. It was just a fun, you know, lighthearted group, lots of joking around going on at the table. I thought he would fit in really well. Um, and the gaming group that I played in quickly seemed to enjoy him and, dare I say, the trouble that he caused as well. Um, but soon after, away from the table, he also became my default wizard that I would create in any video game that let me play as a dedicated magic user type of class. And I noticed how great he was for that because of my particular interests as I play those kinds of games. And then more so, I, I noticed other ways in which he was great for that when I'm streaming games, playing as a Magic user. And I'll specifically mention four reasons for uh, why I like playing him right now, anyway. Um, number one, when I play as RPGs, uh, just on a personal level, I like to see my character's power grow so I can enjoy the, the fantasy of having crazy, huge powers and abilities with lots of visual spectacle. Um, I, I think this is the core of why many of us play pretend as kids and why we enjoy video games and other fiction throughout our lives. You know, we'd all love to be more capable or more resistant to harm than we are. We imagine, what would it be like if I could fill in the blank, you know? Um, I'm not really interested in the fantasy of dominating other people uh, with those powers, so I'm really kind of selectively enjoying aspects of gaining power in games, um, with my enjoyment specifically being the power itself rather than um, the, the means of acquiring it and th those kinds of things. Because you have to be really focused on that uh, if you want to make the best of increasing your power in a lot of games. Um, and so for Eldarast to be a consistent character who will get me to the heights of that power fantasy, get those stats up as quick as possible, he has to be driven to acquire power with basically no regard for anyone else, or at least they're a much lesser priority. So that already, if I'm going to try on the, to unite the meta level with the lore level, kind of shapes his personality in, in really a huge way. Um, the second reason uh, I like playing as Elder Ass is that I like to blow through game elements that don't interest me as much. Most games don't interest me in terms of their story. Every once in a blue moon, um, but most times they don't, which means that Eldarast, in service to Pater, blows through conversations, is very dismissive of people sometimes, disregards people, so that Pater can just get onto the fun part of getting the next quest marker and chasing it. So again, it's that uniting what I want to mechanically on a meta level with what's going on on a lore level. And, um, and sometimes, you know, on a meta level, if I'm frustrated with dumb or unhelpful NPCs or glitches or shortcomings or just weird things that happen, Elderast, as a grouch, naturally calls out those moments, expresses his own frustration with them, which is fun for me. And I, I've, I've been streaming now. It's fun, I think, for some gamers watching who may relate to that kind of frustration that uh, is coming up in a game. Um, the third reason I like to play as Eldarast um, is that I'm often curious what game developers may or may not have accounted for in player choice or how their worldview might be expressed in the writing if I make and explore certain choices. Um, that meta-level curiosity sometimes makes the good path interesting to me, and sometimes the, the, it makes the, the evil path kind of be the one that's going to pique my curiosity. Um, 
Yeah, I, and I just like the freedom to explore my meta-level curiosity. I, I care about that a whole lot more than playing as like a, a good character, a character that makes sense or whatever. Um, and so uh, how does that work? You can't play a good character and explore the evil paths if I'm curious about those. At least not play a character who's in lore consistently good. Um, a morally good character can only choose the morally good path. But Eldarast can choose the evil path or pretend to be good now and then if it suits his long-term goals. Or he can make choices seemingly randomly as a, as a result of what may be insanity on his part or dementia on his part. So all of those, those elements of lore, possible insanity, possible dementia, that allows me to in lore justify any kind of like random choices I might feel like exploring on a meta level. So uh, it allows him to be an internally consistent character while also just going down whatever dialogue path, whatever quest path most interests me as a curious player in that moment. Uh, and then the fourth reason that comes to mind right now for why I like to uh, play as Eldarast is that in, in subtle ways, mixed in with the humor, Eldarast is also a cautionary tale. He uh, gives in to the human tendency to sort of blame God or the powers that be for everything and take no responsibility for himself. But in doing this, you know, he's a pitiable character. He's not a model of what we should be like. It's understood by everyone watching him. This guy's clearly not a model. Um, he's a warning in absurd form of what we can become like. No one really wants to be Eldarast, even though we might enjoy watching him or I enjoy playing him. No one really wants to be Eldarast. And while it's not a front and center priority, nor is it frequent or obvious as I play him, I think he has the potential to give us reasons to reflect on our own thoughts, our own inclinations in a way that is worthwhile. So if you haven't figured it out yet, I think that in some circumstances it can be actually very valuable to play as an evil character in games. Um, and if you want some much more in-depth and scripture-based thoughts on the general idea of Christians playing as evil characters and reconciling that with scripture, you can check out the video I made a while back uh, titled, Can Christians Be Evil in Games? on Christian Geek Central's main YouTube channel. And I'll try to put a link to that in the video description below. Uh, for now, and for the first time ever in my content anywhere, I'm going to present the origin story of Eldarast as told by the bitter old wizard himself. The Journal of Eldarast, Common Era of Me 83, Entry Number One. My name is Eldarast, a name all shall know and fear. I spent my entire life learning from and then teaching at a college of magic. I had quite an aptitude for understanding the theory of magic, but sadly had great difficulty putting it into practice myself. Throughout my time both learning and teaching at the college, I was ridiculed and publicly mocked by my peers as well as greatly humiliated on multiple occasions. Any time I was not being mistreated, I was simply ignored and considered insignificant for my perceived lack of talent. My father died when I was very young. My loving mother raised me by herself in a life bordering on poverty. When she became ill, I cared for her until her death just before my final year as a student of the college. For my entire senior year, I kept a lock of her hair with me always. I grieved for her deeply and could occasionally be seen weeping in the darkened corners of the college halls. At the end of that year, I was invited to a celebration by my fellow graduates. It seemed my peers were endeavoring to repent of the horrible way they had treated me. However, upon arrival at the party, I was once again mocked and humiliated. A few of my classmates held me down while others pulled the precious lock of hair from my hands. They threw it to the ground so that all attending could gather in a circle to urinate and defecate on the token of my mother's love. 
I tried to put this behind me, to be the better man. I tried to attribute this behavior to the foolishness of youth. But in the years thereafter, even as a professor at the same College of Magic, I was not only mistreated by students in my classroom, but the faculty, my so-called colleagues, laughed along in approval as my pupils disrespected me, and at times, they even joined them in ridiculing me. This no longer because of my lack of talent, but for my socially abrasive and awkward nature. Additionally, my appearance troubles those with weak stomachs. In service to greater priorities, my hygiene is poor and my appearance always crusty, with every crevice and wrinkle harboring little bits of matter that contribute to my pungent odor. But to those whose fragility took offense at me, I called their discomfort a small justice inflicted back upon them as the result of years of their abuse. It has also been the case that those I encounter sometimes treat me as if I were a senile old man. Old I certainly am, but... I seem to have forgotten what I was going to write. I suppose I do get a bit mixed up from time to time. Certainly a side effect of peering beyond the veil of reality where none else dare look. If this should give the appearance of insane babbling now and then, it is a price I gladly pay. And they shall all kneel to my power in the end, the fools. In my career, I was overlooked in every way possible. Despite serving longer and working harder at the college than any other staff member, my conviction that great powers may be unlocked by incorporating fecal matter into spellcraft was not received well, nor my habit of bottling my own feek and keeping it ever present for such purposes. And so my retirement was ultimately forced upon me by political maneuvering among staff and students, which proved the proverbial straw on the camel's back. No doubt they would say I didn't merely break. I snapped. My purpose made clear, I withdrew to my shack in the woods and obsessively studied my craft. My passion to learn and master the magical arts was driven by the epiphany of my destiny. To one day enact revenge upon all who have mistreated me. I began keeping an extensive log, my detailed recollections of mistreatment, an ever-growing multi-volume work I now refer to as my Imperial Agenda, as it describes in exquisite detail the sufferings I will inflict when I come into my rule. The journal I now write in serves as an appendix to the Imperial Agenda, providing context for my glorious and eternal vengeance to come. The pursuit of this destiny has gone far beyond passion. It is clearly a birthright, implanting in me a feverish need to gain ever more power, so that one day all the multiverse, along with its petty and disinterested collection of gods would kneel and weep tears of joy that they might be worthy to suffer under the horrific rule of Elderest. Until then, I travel with whomever I believe will be most useful to me on my quest to gain power. 
As needed, I secure the loyalty of others by being useful to them as a wizard, inwardly knowing they will one day serve me in some capacity, or perhaps in their death before then. Always with me, usually incorporated into a staff or similar focus for magic, is the desecrated lock of my mother's hair, still soaked in urine and caked in feces, preserved, encased in amber. Whenever I employ my magical powers, it serves as a constant reminder of the revenge that drives me onward. So there you go. He's been through some stuff, and he's not happy about it. Um, finally, to get you ready for Elderast's continuing adventures in the world of Dragon Age, I'll replay his final moments in the world of Skyrim uh, to finish up this video, and then tune in next week. Although previously posted on CGC's main YouTube channel, I am re-editing the opening hours of my Dragon Age Origins series as we properly get this weekly playthrough series started. And that first installment will now also include a brand new journal entry read by Elderas that explains how he crossed from the world of Skyrim to the world of Dragon Age. I hope you enjoy. Alduin does not arrive, but why? This is supposed to be a mere vision of the past, and yet, something has changed. Reading the Elder Scroll has awakened something in me, enabling me to not merely see the past, but to travel to it. And here, now, this awakening within me seems to prevent Alduin from arriving. <laughs> Something of my mere presence repels him, which means he will never arrive, never be sent forward into time by these fools. I have changed the very course of history. And what's more, yes, my forgotten knowledge, stripped away when I was mysteriously brought to this world, is now returning to me, yes. I have at last awakened to my full power! Power over time! Power to destroy! Yes, perish, you weak-minded cattle! unwitting allies of these presumptuous gods. You all deserve death for the life they have inflicted upon me. And finally, finally, power to rule. As even kings now bow before me. And yet, the so-called gods of this world are clearly too weak to be the source of my suffering in life. Like all worlds, this one is subject to decay, a principle which points back to a beginning which requires a singular, uncaused cause. Something outside of time. Something with a will. Yes. There can be but a single being responsible for all of existence, and it is he alone who must pay for the life I was given. I shall find him yet. If not in this world, then in another.